So you want to be a great swordsman, eh? Alright, I'll teach you. Just be forewarned, swordsman is a skill-based class that cannot be played optimally with auto battle. I recommend swordsman for people who are self-critical and strive to achieve high technical skill. Today in this guide, I'm going to cover all the basics and lay a foundation for future more advanced lessons. So to begin, Swordsman is a melee character, so you have a 5 second cooldown on your roll, while Engineer and Rogue have 7 second cooldowns. Because of this, it's very difficult for a Rogue or Engineer player to escape you, so when you have a favorable situation where they're running away from you and you could possibly kill them, just know that very likely they cannot outrun you or out mobility you. You can probably get to them. The three Swordsman abilities are really simple, I'll cover them real quick. Spinning Assault is going to be your bread and butter. It, it's a dash attack that also knocks the enemy down for 1.5 seconds. Very useful. Your other two abilities, Soaring Slash and Pristine Blade, are very similar. They both deal damage and deal a slow. Soaring Slash has a longer range and the slow is less potent, while Pristine Blade has a shorter range, but the slow is more potent. So in Lava Valley, there are three types of teams you can find yourself in. Carry, carry, support, 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 carry, or three players of relatively equal CP. To do well in Lava Valley, you must be able to play in each of these three team types. Many people do not realize this, but you can switch decks while in Lava Valley. Meaning you can switch passives, abilities, gear, and familiars in the middle of a match to better fulfill your role. To make use of this, you should create a carry deck and a support deck, at least, plus any other decks you think may be helpful, for example a deck with three healing familiars. Utilizing decks, you don't have to worry about if the setup you're queuing with is optimal, you can basically just have three optimal decks that you like a lot and then adapt to what matchmaking throws at you. So here's a tier list I made of the skills available to swordsmen. Anything with SB on it is basically something I consider a skill based skill, it might not work for everybody, not everybody might be able to get a feel for it. but. Uh, from my point of view, with the skill I have, these is where I rank the different skill-based abilities and abilities that I don't think require that much skill. Uh, Vital Spark and Siphoning Lunge, I see them as S-tier abilities. Vital Spark heals your team, gives them a shield, and increases their max HP by a considerable percent. I believe 20% at max rank. Uh, Siphoning Lunge uh, increases your party's defense and reduces uh, your target's defense. So it's like it just creates a gap between your target and your team. Uh, grasping Roots, uh, Static Field, Meteor Strike, I think they're all kind of equally good. Uh, they're useful in different situations and different play styles. Uh, like Stunning is different than rooting someone in place. When you stun, an, stun a target, they can't attack you back. But when you root a target, they can't attack you back. So like grasping rootsing an engineer or rogue sometimes you just still just get popped right stunning people uh they can't attack you back so it's a much more reliable form of cc in my opinion uh personally i like running grasping roots because it's very easy for me to land but if i was playing consistently i think against very skilled players I would probably run a stun so as the community's skill increases over time i will likely stop using roots and start picking up uh a stun ability i might run a divine blade or unleashed blade with a deadly marker i might run static field i might run meteor strike i might even use shadow disc um if i feel like i get the uh the feel down for it and i can hit the three second stun on it um you know relatively consistently uh, on this list, the two most underrated abilities, in my opinion, are Dark Balloon and Shadow Disc. Uh, Dark Balloon is basically like Grasping Roots, but it has a shorter cooldown and roots for a shorter amount of time. Uh, I like the concept of Dark Balloon because you're basically getting uh, twice as many root chances in as if you're using Grasping Roots. Um, Shadow Disc, if you can actually land it, is a three second stun on the way back. So you shoot the disc out and on the way back, if it hits somebody, they get three seconds stunned. Um, I believe also, you know, if you can line it up, you can stun their whole team. You know, if on the return of the disc, you hit all three of their team members, I believe, you know, their entire team is stunned for three seconds. So I, I think Shadow Disc is kind of like a dark horse ability. You know, whenever a player comes along that's really mastered it, he's going to be a menace. 
As for defensive field and lightning ball, um, I don't see them as having a very solid place in the meta. Uh, lightning ball especially um, defensive field does have one use it, it does give everyone standing in it a 25 percent increase in defense and crowd control uh resistance so um if you if you place defensive field down at the beginning of an engagement and their enemy team konas all of you um you're much more likely to survive it while standing in that field and also you have a a 25% additional chance of resisting the crowd control effect of Kona. So that is actually one use that defensive field has uh, in, in Lava Valley. Uh, moving on to passives, as a carry, these are the passives you'll likely want to be running. Any combination of these is pretty much fine. Uh, personally, I think if you have good positioning and you know how to engage properly, speed aura is invaluable. Um, like you should always be running it. Um, I think that if you're good at playing alongside your team, engaging with your team, uh, then enhanced defense is great. Fortify and Last Stand are both fantastic for carry swordsmen. Um, if you're a highly technical player and, and you're able to make it work, Deadly Marker is also you know, fantastic for keeping people locked down. It gives you a three second stun on your next auto attack every 30 seconds, which is pretty solid. It's just not going to give you the, the, the huge raw stats that the uh, other passives could give you. Now, you can run auras other than speed aura as a carry, like attack aura, defense aura, whatever. But generally, someone on your team is going to be running those auras, and they don't stack with each other. Like two HP auras, two attack auras, they don't stack. So really, you just want everyone on your team to be running one of the auras. Now, as for support passives, uh, again, speed aura is very good. Uh, if you're good at initiation, if you're good at positioning, speed aura is perfect. Um, again, if you're good at engaging with your team, fighting with your team, enhanced defense can be very useful. Um, again, deadly marker, if you're able to thread the needle and really make it useful, it can be good on, on a support play style. Now, um, as support, really one of your one of your main objectives is to make sure your team has the auras they need right because you don't really want your carries to be running auras you want the lower cp individuals on the team to be running auras so that the carry can run something like last stand like fortify right whatever it is uh any combination of these passives is fine if if you're less skilled at the game i would just run run all auras right if you're more skilled at the game you know you can run enhanced defense you can run deadly marker right you can run speed aura but if you're like if you're not good at positioning uh you're not good at uh fighting with your team you're not going to be able to thread the needle and lock a carry down for six plus seconds uh then i would just run attack defense and hp aura right you know if you're on the more skilled side you know you could try running speed aura enhanced defense uh deadly marker right so now that we've covered skills and passives that naturally brings us to familiars uh, as you can see on the screen i have made a list of the meta familiars split into s tier a tier and b tier really quick i'll go through um the tiers and explain why each familiar is on the list so first we'll go through s tier um molten line should be self-explanatory keeps you from going below one one hp for for many seconds especially if you get him awakened like max it's like four or five seconds it's crazy <clears throat> uh crab -a lantern is like zanya's illegal legends it just makes you invulnerable for however many seconds it also i guess it's worth noting it boosts um the healing you receive while you're invulnerable and it boosts your uh your familiar damage while it's invulnerable so technically you could crab and then Kona, and your Kona will do bonus damage. <clears throat> Next on the list is Rimu. Um, his ability is not that good right now. In global, uh, it, there's it, it's buffed in Korea. Like Korea's Rimu is stronger than ours, like their ability. Um, but the passives on Rimu are awesome. I believe it's uh, reduced damage taken from players and increased stun resist. Uh, Hippocampus, nice AOE damage, AOE silence. You know, pretty easy to hit. Uh, solid S tier familiar Staghorn um, uh, very solid CC resistance passive and uh, their uh, reflect ability is pretty great on carries when you're getting focused uh, the reflected damage can be pretty crazy and then in addition you have uh, the chance to stun which is nice so uh, yeah Staghorn I'd say definitely a S tier familiar especially when you're in a carry situation um, in a support situation, I think there's probably better choices.
Terracona, of course, is self-explanatory. A uh, homing missile with the knockdown. You know, what's not to love? So starting us off on A tier is Toko. Um, I put Toko separate from the Healing Familiars because um, while I do think Healing Familiars and Toko both belong in A tier, I would say Toko's closer to like A+. Plus. Um, uh, Toko's definitely the best of the Healing Familiars unless you're trying to remove a status ailment because he reduces the cooldown of your special skills, uh, which is it, it's especially phenomenal like on Engineer. You can run, you can run uh, two heals and your cooldown buff, and you uh, and it, it feels like it's up all the time if you're running Toko. Uh, Arachne is solid because her passive gives you increased damage to players, and also her ability does uh, a percent of the target's max HP as additional damage, which culminates, I believe, into what's probably the hardest hitting familiar in the game right now. The only problem is Arachne's uh, skill is way harder to land than Terracona's, which is why she is not S tier. Uh, Bunnybot, she gives a shield and provides CC resistance while the shield is up. It's really only good or usable, I would say, when you're in the carry position. I don't think it's really usable when you're in the support position. Uh, healing Familiars is self-explanatory, and Sorbor, the new familiar. Um, Sorbor... He has a 3.5 second stun. Uh, it might increase with awakenings. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, right off the bat, like just sore bore, no awakenings. If you land his ability on a target that is burning, the stun lasts 3.5 seconds. Um, I don't think he's very good, but I do think that if you got good at landing a burn and good at landing sore bore, he would at least be A tier because um, like for example on Swordsman uh, 3.5 second stun in addition to all the other CC we have the person you're hitting would never get to play right <laughs> so um, so I, I'd say Sorbor with a burn setup probably A tier uh, I haven't seen anyone using it I'm just guessing at this point right um, so moving on to B tier we have Bird, Might, and Flutterby uh, Bird is on here because his passive reduces damage taken from players and reduces uh, darkness damage taken uh, as well as his ability uh, is a one second stun if it lands, which isn't crazy, but it's better than a lot of the other uh, familiars. Like for example, like Ouroboro, you know, like his ability just hits and then applies poison, which would be good if there was maybe another familiar that, uh, you know, benefited from a enemy being poisoned, uh, but there's not at the moment. So that's the reason that Might's on this list and like Ouroboros not because Sorbor benefits from hitting burn targets, right? Uh, Flutterbee uh, makes the list because her ability, it, uh, it provides basic attack evasion, skill evasion, and movement speed, which can be good in the carry position uh, if you utilize it correctly, right? And uh, last on the list, Dinoceros, uh, he basically makes the, makes the list for the same reasons Bird does. He's just more useful than the other uh, available familiars to the point where he's just a little bit up. He's just a rung above them. You know, he's mentionable, right? His ability stuns, I believe, and does a little damage. Uh, nothing crazy. Uh, so if, if a familiar didn't make this list, it doesn't necessarily mean that the familiar is bad. It just means that in my experience uh, thus far into the game, they haven't stuck out to me enough to where I would I would consider talking about them in this guide and pointing them out to you as something you should invest in the majority of uh the other familiars in the game would probably fall for me uh in like a in like a, a c plus b minus type of tier um with only a couple of them really falling anywhere below that so you know you can't get much worse than b tier but it, it if I were you, I would try to invest in an S and A tier uh, familiars if you want to succeed in Lava Valley. So now that we've covered skills, passives, and familiars, it's about time that we get into combos. Like I said at the beginning of this video, uh, Swordsman is a high skill cap class, and this is where the high skill clap really sh really shines through. Um, so Swordsman have three main combos from what I can see. You have the long combo, the medium combo, and the short combo. The long combo starts with your familiar skill, whether it be Hippocampus, Terracona, whatever. You hit your familiar skill, follow it up with your long range CC, whether that be Grasping Roots, Meteor Thorns, whatever, right? If you don't have long C 
you, if you don't have long range CC, you skip to the next step, which is your dash. Your dash will knock down your opponent, followed by your siphoning lunge, which will knock down your opponent again. While they're knocked down, you hit them with an auto attack to proc deadly marker, which stuns them for three seconds. In those three seconds, you do the maximum DPS you possibly can, then you escape and reset, right? Uh, the medium combo, you basically just remove the long range CC, so you start with your familiar skill, then you dash in, siphoning lunge to knock them down after your first knockdown, auto attack for the deadly marker proc, max DPS, 3 seconds, escape and repeat, right? And then the short combo, you remove uh, the long range CC and the familiar skill, so you dash in, knock them down, knock them down again with siphoning lunge, auto attack them for deadly marker proc, max DPS for 3 seconds, escape and repeat, right? It's short and sweet. Now, there's probably other combos in the game, and you don't have to play around combos. Uh, in a lot of matches, actually, I spread out my DPS, or sorry, my CC, uh, in other ways, right? Like, I you know, use some CC to, to get somebody off of my teammate, right? Then I run over here and knock this guy down, who's, like, really uh, unloading into this guy. And um, not every game provide you the ideal conditions to just do clean combos over and over and over sometimes you're going to have to cc people to keep them from getting the health pack right whatever these are just what i would consider to be uh the classic combos that uh naturally come together uh from the kit that swordsman has to work with so to end this video i'll quickly talk about equipment and i'll do a more in-depth uh dive into equipment in a later video but real quick, I'll touch on a couple of tips. Really, I just have two main tips. Uh, don't use gear with useless passives just because it has more CP. And uh, have synergy across your build. If you're high CP with Terracona, you should have the familiar skill cooldown necklace and the fire damage ring, right? Um, you know, and, and, and you should run things that make sense. Like if you have the Ardor necklace and the Silverbeard necklace but you're relatively low cp well you're probably getting one shotted so there's really no use in running the silver beard necklace in that case run the ardor necklace right if you're huge cp you're probably never getting one shotted and you could actually tank a lot so in that case maybe run the silver beard necklace right so just think these things through and make choices that make sense i am going to do a a whole uh tier list video on equipment um, but I thought it was just a little bit too much to stuff into this video it ended up being very long and I wanted to actually go in depth and talk about each item individually so so that is coming but for this video I just wanted to give you some uh, you know a way to think about your equipment you know don't just go for CP you know, you know in a lot of ways utility is more useful than just flat CP so that should just about wrap up the video. Uh, I tried to give you a good foundation of Swordsman Basics so that in the future I can cover like more advanced uh, things like like uh, matchup strategy and um, you know what to do in certain situations and blah blah blah. Um, if you learned something, please drop a like. It really helps me out. And if you'd like to see more of my content in the future, hit that subscription button. Also, if there's anything you want me to cover or anything I didn't cover, please let me know and remind me because I can't think of everything. <laughs> Other than that, I really appreciate you guys watching this far and I wish y'all the best in Lava Valley. Goldie Gusher out. Peace.